it is so good uh, to see all of you this morning. Um, the truth, thank you, worship leaders, because you have brought some amazing truth to us. And that challenge to consider that these words that we're singing, they're meant to do something. Um, I know they work tirelessly during the week. Mike, uh, our worship pastor, thinking about songs, praying over them. How do they, how do they fit? What, what does the Holy Spirit want us to sing? What's the truth? And uh, it's meant for us specifically today, the things that we read. And the truth that even though we may say, who are we, that God would be mindful of us, I, I think we ask that and think that a lot, but we don't really take it to the full extent and just believe that he does. And that scripture tells us that his thoughts towards us are more than the grains of sand on the earth. That's an immeasurable number. And as we gather this morning, uh, he knows us as a local church body. He knows this family here. He knows the unique ins and outs of our gathering um, and how we love each other, try to serve each other. Um, he wants the best for, our, for this church, but he wants the best for you and for me as individuals as well. Um, that his, his first goal is his glory and all wrapped up in that is our good. That the way he is glorified is through our good and the way things are good is when he's glorified in our lives. They're all, they're intertwined together. And I think it's such a fitting thought as we get to the end of the series we've been in this summer that Chad has led us through summer rules where we've looked at the Ten Commandments, a different one each week. And I think when we get to the very end, there's nine that we've covered so far. It, you, if you're like me, you've got a list and you're thinking, okay, here are things to do and not to do. I, I got to do what I can to obey these. I'm a rule follower to obey these. And it can maybe feel overwhelming. You know, when you come to the end of the summer, um, if you, you probably had all these great plans with your family, with your kids. Um, we're going to do this. We're going to go there. We're going to do that. It's going to be awesome. So many things. And now school's like a week or two away. We've done nothing. We better get on these things. We've got to cram. I think maybe thinking about all the rules or commands that God gives us, we can feel that way about them as well. Okay, I need to make sure I don't take God's name in vain. I need to make sure I keep the Sabbath holy. I need to make sure I don't have any idols. I want to honor my parents. I need to make sure I don't murder anybody. I need to make sure I'm not lying. You know, there's all these that we go through and think, okay, we got to keep those. The, the way we're, we've done this series, you, you've noticed that it hasn't been in order. And in fact, today, the last sermon in the series, we're actually looking at the first commandment have no other gods before me, and that's by design. And, and that's be, because at the very end, what we wanted to do is not you move into the fall with a burdening list of things to do and not do from Scripture, but we wanted you to know that God has designed life and our lives as individuals to, to be lived out in such a way that keeping these commands, doing and don't doing, really becomes natural when we have things in the right place and in the right order. It's, it's this first command really that enables us to keep the other nine. It's, it's this one that kind of opens the door and sets us free from a list that can be burdensome to a life that is really a blessing. And so we're going to look at this first command um, the, today and just kind of ask a couple of questions. One, are we keeping it? How do we know if we are or not? And then how do we? Very simple as we come to this. So um, the command, it's at the very beginning, Exodus 20. It's the first one. We're gonna look at the first three verses in Exodus 20. You're, you're familiar probably with what this one is. I may have even already said it. So extra points if you're listening. Um, Exodus 20 verse one, then God gave the people all these instructions. And it begins, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. So let's just pause right there. I think it's important for us to know that before God gave any commands, any instructions, he first rescued them. And, and that's important to know the order of things because God didn't say, here are all my commands, live by them, and then I will rescue you. He chose a people for himself 
that for the past several hundred years had lived in slavery, by, uh, in slavery to the Egyptians. And he said, I'm now going to lead them out. I'm going to do it in a miraculous way. And then when I have my people gathered on the way to the land, I'm going to give them, I'm going to teach them how to live as my people. So he saves them and then he calls them to a different way of living. That's so freeing for us. Some of you, maybe that's all you need to hear today. God is not asking you to get your stuff together so he can save you. God is saving you so he can help you get your stuff together, right? So that's what he's doing with his people. He's not just giving burdensome roles. He's saying, here's how you live now in your freedom in a way that's for your benefit and for my glory. So he gives this command, the very first one, don't have any other gods before me. And now you may walk in, hear that, and think, check, right? I worship the God of the Bible. I'm not worshiping Muhammad or this guy or that guy. Like, there's no other deities in my life. It's God. I believe him. I'm a, I'm a man after God's own heart, gosh darn it. And that's, that's my God. And that's probably true for the majority of us in here. That's why you're here unless you were drug here. But for the most part, there's, you're here because you at least have some sort of thought that, okay, God's important. Uh, I need to know more about him. You might be here just trying to figure out where truth is. We're glad you're here. Um, but the majority of people in the room have said, I, I, I claim God. I claim the God of the Bible. And um, so you're necessarily not worshiping all these other gods, and you would think you're good, but we're going to peel this back a little bit because, spoiler alert, we're not good. Um, we have some gods we need to talk about. We have one specific God we need to talk about. Um, but I want you to get a visual with this first. When he says, no other gods before me, just in the Hebrew cultural language and visual that would come when they heard this originally, they would have thought of a throne room with a king on the throne, God on the throne. And the idea is that he is already there. God is already the king of all creation. He, he does rule over your life whether you've claimed that or not, but the, our eternity is based on if we're going to submit to that or not. But he is already king. And so the visual here is us coming before God the king. And um, we're carrying another God in with us before his throne. And we're like, yeah, okay. How should I live my life? Right? We're talking to this other. So God says, don't bring any of that stuff before me. I alone am God. And um, we might, again, think, well, we don't really have that issue, um, but we need to think a little more broadly about what a God or who a God is in that, in that word. God is a title in scripture that is taken to be a name of Yahweh, right? We've talked about that, of our God. And so it's both a, it's both a, a, a general title of God's, lower G, and then the God, capital G. So a God is something that people look to when they need help in life. Basically, we say, okay, I can't do this. I need a higher power, right? So gods are things that when we need help, when we need encouragement, when we need validation, when we need rescue, it's something that we turn to because we think that thing has the power to meet whatever the need is. That's, that's a God. And if you've been in church any amount of time, you've, you've heard examples like, well, for us today, it may not be this, this physical idol or that physical idol from back in Old Testament times, but it's things like our money that we think, well, I need some security, so money's going to provide that. Or it can be things like our reputation. Like I feel insecure if people just respected me more, recognize the authority or the power I have. I, I definitely feel better in my life and things would be good. Or it can even be things like escape. And, and maybe you think, oh, I'm so overwhelmed. What I need right now is to get away. I need to travel. I need to go somewhere. Or it can be an escape such like substance abuse. Like this is so overwhelming. I just need to forget about things for a bit. And a substance is what we go to. It could be something even as, as sinister as pornography that we think I just need to escape what's actually really, really happening and jump into a fantasy world for a bit. And that'll make me feel better. 
We look at these things as gods, and they can be described as that. But what I want us to consider today is, what if they aren't the problem? What if money is not really the issue? Us viewing it as something that would bring us true security. What if that's just more of a symptom? And what if our desire to be respected and have authority and power and for people to lo- like really love us, what if that's just a symptom of something else and it's not necessarily a God in and of itself or escape or anything else we can think of? Because here's, here's what I want to propose this morning. I don't think those individual things we need to look at first. Okay, money, what am I doing? Here, what am I doing? Here, what am I doing? I think those are symptoms of a much more destructive and sinister God that we like to bring into the throne room of God Almighty. And that God is me. That God's you. That God's people. I don't mean to like be Debbie Downer here, but the gods that we bring in are really self. It's us. You've heard people talk about the God of self, especially in this culture. There's so much about self-love, self-help, self-respect, self-esteem, and there's good places for some of those things, but the most destructive, damaging, and dark God we could ever bring in front of the God of all creation is our self And I'm not necessarily just talking about my physical body. I'm talking about what it is in me that determines what I desire, what I want, what I want to chase after, what's most important in in, in my life. And scripture is very clear that the heart of man is deceptive above all things. And so if I say, I want to be led by my heart, I know what's best, then I'm picking up a God that's going to act out in viewing money in the wrong way, that's going to act out in viewing sex the wrong way, that's going to act out in viewing other people or even self the wrong way. And what I've done is I have come before God with the God of me. And here, here's the truth. I, I don't want to step on any toes. We are terrible gods. We are. We are terrible gods. We don't know everything. We think we do. We don't really love people. We think we do. We we, we really don't even, we, we just don't know what's best, but we think we do. And the problem with the God of self is it's nothing new. It's been the enemy's attack, the devil's attack and deception from the very beginning to get us to think that our God The God of self is really the one that knows best. If you think back to the creation story, Adam and Eve are there, and then the the serpent enters, and God has said, you can eat anything you want, but not from this tree. It's to protect you. And then the serpent comes in, and he says, did God really say? And in that moment, this seed of doubt is placed into the heart of man and woman, and they begin to question, is God really for our good? Like, did he really say we can't? Is is he really looking at, does he really know best? And in that moment, what happens is that mankind determines that our opinion has more value and more worth than God's word, his truth. And from that point to now, it has been the reason for all of the evil, destruction, terror, hardship, trouble mankind has faced. It all goes back to the root of thinking we know more than God does. We know what's best. We know what we need. Therefore, I am going to be God. Now, in the room here, more than likely, you would say, well, God is on the throne of my life. Like, if we have that picture, he is there. And he probably is, for the most part. But I think what we like to do, kind of talking to the Christians in the room right now, is that if there's that throne there, kind of what we want to do is walk in with the God of self and just kind of like scooch him over a little bit, right? So we got one bun on it. I'm not going to say it about him. But we're both on the throne. And we think we can just kind of share the responsibility. But God, his very first instruction to the people is no other gods. 
Not even a shared responsibility or authority over you. Now, when you hear these things, you might real quickly be able to say, yep, that's me. That's me. I don't listen to him at all. And I really need to. I bet for the majority of us, this gives us a sense of, I don't know. I'm I'm here. I do godly things. I listen to good music. I give. I serve. There's all these things that would say that I don't have another God on the throne. But what I want to do is just a pop quiz for a moment. And just ask some questions to know, have we brought the God of ourself into the throne room of God Almighty? So let me ask a couple questions. First one is this, do I welcome God's instruction in my life or do I ignore it? It's kind of like if, if you're doing something and, and, and there's a conviction over that, maybe you read about it in scripture and you're like, oh. Scripture says not to or to do this or you've just been corrected in some way through a sermon, through listening, through the Holy Spirit. Do you, do you welcome that instruction? Like do you, um, do you, are you submissive to that or do you get defensive? I think it's a good barometer of where we are in that relationship with God of who is God. Because if I'm being corrected, if there's something scripture says that is wrong or off in my life, my response to that tells me who the main God in my life is. If I get all frustrated, like, well, that was then, this is now, or God doesn't really understand, or, you know, that's old school. That's what it was back then. We're a new culture now. Well, listen, if, if you say one thing and the Bible says the other, you're wrong. I'm wrong. And so we go to God's word, and if I'm defensive against his truth, I'm probably serving the God of self. Here's another question. Does God have final authority in my decisions, or do I? Like, and, and of course, this is easy to consider with big decisions, home purchases, moves, jobs. Yeah, I want to pray. I want God to tell me, but it even affects our day-to-day decisions. Hey, I got a little bit of a bonus. What should I do with this? How should I spend this? Or um, something has changed in my schedule last minute. Am I going to make the right thing work? Or there's, there can be a whole host of things that come up in life every day. And is God even given any consideration? And even if he is, at the end of the day, is it what he thinks or what we think is right? That can help us determine who the God is. Here's another. Am I more concerned with gathering wealth or blessing others? Now... It is wise and prudent to save. It's wise and prudent to have money set aside for the what ifs. It is not wise to put all of our trust and hope in that for the what ifs. It's not wise to find our security in our savings account or our checking account um, it's, or our Venmo account. It's not It's not wise to do that. And so when we look at what we earn, are we thinking, oh, I need need this for security. I need to pack this away. It's my money. I want to spend it how I want. I've been dreaming. I've been thinking about this. Or is there any thought of, you know, I know someone in need. What if I could help? What if I could give? What if I could support? That helps us determine. Uh, Here's another one. Do my closest friends love God and encourage me in my faith? Or do they help me feel better about how I live? Like what, what do you hear from those closest to you when it comes to maybe living outside or in opposition to what God's word says? If there are people that are falling after God, are they speaking truth into your life? And that's a good friend. That's a good friend. Or are they people that maybe you hang out with because it makes you feel better about the activities you're in because they're doing it as well? Listen, the person who wants God to be on the throne and wants to to sacrifice the God of self, that person, I guarantee you, their inner circle are people who are also pursuing that. Guarantee. I I don't know if I know anybody who is a man or a woman after God's own heart that does not have that as their inner circle. Maybe it's there. You can introduce me to them and I'll tell them they need better friends. Another one, does my Sunday morning self match my Monday morning self? Now, I want us to be honest and open here. I think this is a church where we can be authentic. I think think that's true. But if we're swapping up personalities and activity between church people and work people, 
more than likely we're doing that because we don't want people to think less of us because we're trying to follow the God Almighty. Instead, it's probably the God of self. One last one. Am I content with having Jesus alone? Would I be content with having Jesus alone or do I need to have the money or the reputation or the escape or whatever else we might put there? Because if we sit back and think, what if God decides to pull a job on us and all those things are removed from life and it's just us and God, us and Christ in our life, do we think we would be content? Now, that's a hard one, a hard one. I'm not saying it's an easy decision. And, and if you're in that position, Job questioned, it's okay. God knows your questions. He can handle it. But would we say, as long as I have him, if the money's gone, I have Christ. If the relationships go away, I have Christ. If the escapes are no longer there and I have to just confront the mess, it's okay, I have Jesus. Our answer to that might let us know who the God is in our life. Now, I said earlier that we make terrible gods. At the root, we need to understand this. At the root, though, of all of that, and even the God, we might be sitting here thinking, yeah, okay, there's a God of self in my life, and there's a lot of times I bring him before God. Do you know that that is not just you doing that? That is the fallen nature in mankind that does that. That's a result of evil from the depths of hell that is at war every moment in your life to ignore God Almighty and to seek to serve the God of self. There's, there's something much deeper. It's not just reading a book about God. It's not just taking some seminars. It's not just listening to some sermons. It is a complete tearing down and rebuilding of the very foundations of our life in order to live a life where God is on the throne. And anytime myself gets in the way, I'm gonna die. To, I'm gonna kill that off. Because you have an enemy that is so powerful and so sinister, he's even gonna make those things seem good. But Jesus himself said, John 10, 10, a thief, our enemy, the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what happens when we run the show. Many of you have examples and stories of that. When it was all about self, life was crumbling. I had to get to the bottom. I had to hit rock bottom. I had to go through this before I realize. Many of us have those kinds of stories. I have that kind of story. Because our enemy wants to destroy us. And the best way he can do that is to think that we know best. But Jesus said, I have come so that they, you, me, may have life and have it in abundance. See, this command and all the commands that are given, these are not burdensome commands. They're commands meant to bless. And the teaching, the command, the rule that God gives first to have no other gods before him, this is a command of grace and kindness and goodness because it's a command that leads us away from destruction. It's a command that leads us away from trouble and it's a command that really leads us to a life of contentment and joy and goodness. Uh, we, we talked about how all the commands, we, we've wanted to share three things that they kind of all have in common. And that, they're, that the commands keep us safe. Just talking about trouble and difficulty in uh, Psalm 16, 4, a very interesting verse says, troubles multiply for those who run after other gods. Wow. What if I'm the God I'm running after? Well, if I do that, you know what's going to multiply in my life? Not contentment, not joy, not security, not satisfaction, trouble. That's the teaching of the word that when we're the God, it's trouble. Uh, we also talk about how these commands set us apart. Listen, the whole world is striving to be known as the one who has it all together. Every person wants that. Hey, he's got money. They, he's successful. He's got a great house. He's got a great reputation. But you notice King David who 
may have had all of those things. How did God call him? He's a man after my heart. See, that's how we're set apart. God wants us to be known as people who are pursuing him and not pursuing self and these other gods. So it, it sets us apart. You will be different. You will be weird when you're pursuing the God of the Bible. And then the third thing is these commands reveal God's heart. And it is so good. He is not a God of rules and do's and don'ts. He is a God of grace. 2 Kings 17, 39, you must worship only the Lord your God. He is the one who will rescue you from your enemies. See, the Psalm verse says, if we're chasing other God, there's gonna be trouble. But if we're chasing God Almighty, there's gonna be rescue. There'll be help. There'll be encouragement. There'll be needs in our life that will be met because God rescues those who are pursuing him alone. It's such a great reminder that he's good and these verses are for our good. So as we get to this point, how do we do this? How do we remove self from the equation and not bring other gods before the Lord our God? It, it's really not as complicated as it might seem. Remember I said at the beginning, this, this is the command that enables all the other ones, that kind of encompasses all the other ones. So I don't have to come to this list. All right, end of the day, what do I do? Am I pursuing God? Listen to what Jesus himself said in Matthew 22 as he's asked about all the commands and the laws that were given in the Old Testament. Jesus replied this. The, the, the question was, what's the greatest? What's the most important? Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest command. Okay, him alone, right? We need to love him. And then it says, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So there's two things that Jesus says right here. Here's what's most important of all the laws. Love God with all that you are. He's first, he's primary. And love others the same way you love yourself. But then he says something really unique on the back end because those guys may have written out, they may have put stars next to those two on their list of 10 commandments. Okay, we still need to do the other ones. We gotta make sure we're doing these. But listen to what Jesus says after that. He says, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on those two commandments. That in that moment, what Jesus is saying is, not to ignore the Old Testament and what's taught there. He's saying, though, that everything that I want my people to do, everything I hope they're about, everything that will satisfy my heart for how we live is that you love me with all that you have, God, and that you love each other. If you do those things, you're keeping all 10 of the commandments. Because it's when we love him first and we love others that there's no room for self to get in the way. So how do we do this? Because it's not just a one and done thing. I think for believers, it's a daily thing. Daily die to self. I think a, a helpful way, I'm just gonna leave you with one, is to begin our day remembering this. And maybe it's before we get out of bed or before we get on the phone, we're just saying, God, you are God. And I, and I know that. I believe that. I trust that. And I'm not. And Lord, you know all that I need to know for the day. You know what fa- I'm going to face. Lord, you know the best way for me to walk through it, the best decisions to make, the best way to handle people. So God, I, I submit to your direct, whatever you say to me through your word from other people, whatever comes my way, you know, you know what's best. I want to follow you. And God, you are going to bring people into my life today. And there are people just like me who have, a, have trouble following the God of self. So God, I'm gonna pray that you give me all the resources that I need to love them the way I would want to be loved in their situation. I wanna love them like I would love myself. And God, I trust that you'll do that. Help me to do that. And when we do that, what automatically happens is we're not even in the top two for the day. It's God, it's a billion other people and then we're down the list and yeah, maybe there's something we need God to know about. Tell them about that. But if we begin our day thinking God first, others, and then me, 
we begin to daily walk this life where there are no other gods in our life before him. We get to experience his rescue, his presence, his goodness, his contentment. He's a good God. He loves us deeply. And he shows that so clearly through the giving of his son, Jesus Christ, who said that I've come that you may have life abundant. Listen, there's nothing like following Jesus. Nothing like it. You all who have followed self and now are following Jesus, you can attest to that. There's nothing like it. And his great love, he has already offered salvation. And then as we follow him, he's given us the way to live a life that is good for us and glorifying to him. Let's